everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Debbie Chergai. I'm the Executive Director of ASA. Uh, we have a great webinar for you today. Um, we are excited to share the highlights with you of ASA's work during this challenging year. And we're going to be covering federal and state advocacy, policy reform, and ASA educational programming. Uh, we are um, Today, we're going to quickly go over some accomplishments from 2020. Then we will dive into an overview of some of our state and federal advocacy work, review some of the state and national changes in cannabis policy and what the incoming administration could mean for patients. And we are gonna follow this all up with a Q&A segment at the end. So make sure to get your questions ready. You can, um, you can put it in the chat segment or if you wanna post a question anonymously on the bottom of your, um, screen, there should be a little button that says Q&A. And if you post it, then that'll just go to the presenters to see. Uh, feel free to ask any questions during the presentation, uh, during the chat or the Q&A, and we'll get to those at the end. Okay, we're going to get started. Um, first, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, Americans for Safe Access for anyone that isn't familiar with us. Um, we are the oldest and largest national organization of patients, medical professionals, scientists, and concerned citizens promoting safe and legal access to cannabis for therapeutic use and research. We were created in 2002 by Steph Shear, who is now the president of the board, and she will be speaking later in the presentation. Um, and be ongoing, uh, ongoing direct federal, state, and local advocacy um, efforts to improve medical cannabis policy for patients. We have also done an extensive amount of work on education and training for government, the licensed industry, and physicians. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, ASA has been leading the way for patients and researchers on cannabis policy reforms for nearly 20 years. In the last 18 years, uh, Americans for Safe Access has hosted 15 annual lobby days in Congress and hundreds of lobby days across state capitals and local governments. We've scheduled more than 2,600 face-to-face -face meetings with congressional offices to lobby legislators on medical cannabis laws. We've mobilized our 150,000 supporters on the ground to call and email federal and state legislators on medical cannabis related bills and regulations. We've written countless publications that we offer for free on our website to help educate patients, doctors, uh, researchers, covering everything from our 2020 State of the States report, Patient's Guide to CBD, and how to talk to your doctor about using medical cannabis. We've published almost 1 million legal manuals, over 2 million Know Your Rights wallet cards, hundreds of thousands of training manuals, legal, advocacy, industry, and patient education, and countless special reports uh, and other materials. And as I mentioned, all of these resources and much more are available on our website, safeaccessnow.org for free. So let's talk a little bit about 2020. <laughs> Well, 2020 shut a lot of the country and state governments down. Uh, the public health crisis was a call to action for ASA. In 2020, we immediately engaged state governments, urging them to declare cannabis businesses essential to ensure safe and legal access could continue, resulting in 33 states making that declaration to facilitate access. We worked with a coalition of partners to secure house passage of the Moore Act, Safe Banking Act, and Medical Marijuana Research Act. We worked directly with Congressman Lou Correa to secure language from the VA Medicinal Cannabis Research Act into the Moore Act prior to passage. We partnered with the Cannabis Enigma podcast to provide content for a bi-monthly podcast series to amplify the discussion about issues critical to patients. We updated our travel guide uh, to include the news states um, and to help patients learn about reciprocity laws in other states. Uh, and we encourage voters to get out to vote during the election season through our Vote Medical Marijuana campaign. campaign sorry. <laughs> we worked with our coalition partners to secure a yes vote from the US delegation to the United Nations to remove cannabis from Schedule 4 of the Controlled Sus Substances Act. Um, in accordance with the recommendations of the World Health Organization. 
We collaborated with state and local partners to do everything from submit testimony to state regulators in Arkansas, to advising the Commonwealth of Virginia and working to protect patients' ability to smoke cannabis in their apartments in San Francisco. So that's a little bit of the work we've done. We're gonna talk more about that in the presentation, but as you can see, um, while 2020 was a tough year for many, it didn't stop us from doing the work that we needed to do. Uh, we increased the number of digital education and training in events uh, covering pediatric to veteran access um, and the performance of state medical programs in 2020. We participated in important national events like the National Canvas Policy Summit and MJ Biz. And in response to the COVID pandemic, our PFC certification program rapidly developed and deployed a training curriculum focused on safety and hygiene. This course was initially offered as free to anyone through our webinar. Uh, we now have it on our PFC platform for a, a small fee if you're interested. And that's pfccertification.org. Um, I'm going to um, move this over to Andrew, but before he begins talking, I do want to say one thing about um, the COVID crisis. When the COVID crisis hit the United States, our first priority was about patients and their access to this medicine. So while many organiza organizations were, you know, stressing and wondering how to stay afloat, which we were too, <laughs> we continue to work not even knowing if we were gonna have to shut our own selves down um, due to lack of funding, but we, we, we continued to work, everyone on staff continued to work um, in order to make sure that patients across the country had continued access to this medicine. Um, and I wanna say a thank you to everyone on the ACES staff. It was a difficult time um, and it still is a difficult time for many, but because our priority is patients, we really wanted to, we, we knew we had to do something to help them. And Andrew is gonna talk a little bit more about our work that we did. Thank you, Debbie. Um, so on March 15th, ASA held an emergency meeting with stakeholders and put together a plan of eight recommendations to ensure access for patients. The next day, we coordinated with governor's offices and state medical regulators across the country to urge them to maintain safe and legal access for patients during the pandemic. 28 states declared businesses essential and 33 states actually organized temporary enhancements to their cannabis programs uh, that improved access and reduced costs to patients. Uh, among these included 11 states that allowed for delivery or partial delivery, while 15 states already had delivery programs. 16 states allowed for telehealth and 17 allowed every step of the registration process, meaning from um, your doctor's recommendation to actually getting your card. Uh, 20, 26 states allowed for curbside pickup statewide and California allowed it in some jurisdictions. Uh, these dramatic program improvements demonstrate how much can be done for patients directly by state regulators. It also underlines the value of ACEs advocacy and the power of the voice of patients in educating and collaborating with state regulators. ASA offered free memberships for essential employees and businesses, um, uh, cannabis businesses uh, that were declared essential. Uh, so the 2020 edition of ASA's State of the States report is the sixth edition of this annual performance review uh, of state medical cannabis programs. This year's report covered the great work of state regulators in working quickly to keep cannabis businesses open to serve patients during COVID, as we mentioned a minute ago. If you haven't checked it out yet, it is an incredible resource illustrating the growth of state programs to better serve patients and a guide for state governments on outstanding issues and key concerns raised by patients with these programs. While state programs are improving, most programs maintain ongoing challenges in key areas ranging from patient rights and civil protections uh, like employment, school access for pediatric patients, um, or even DUI penalties for using prescribed medicine, um, to insufficient access and the unaffordability of legal, of legal cannabis medicine. ASA not only reviews state programs and consults with patients on their effectiveness, but we also work directly with patients, doctors, and state lawmakers uh, to improve programs performance. 
The report is free to download and is available on ACES website, along with the webinar and the blog covering the report. You can see the link there in the slide. Um, so a lot of 2020, uh, uh, a lot of legislation happened in 2020. Um, one is the uh, Medical Marijuana Research Act, which was approved by the House last Wednesday. The bill would allow researchers studying the effects of cannabis to use uh, cannabis grown by professional cultivators in state medical cannabis programs, um, rather than the research grade uh, cannabis supplied by NIDA and grown by the University of Mississippi. Uh, the week prior, uh, the House also passed the MORE Act, legislation to deschedule cannabis from the Federal Controlled Substances Act, tax cannabis and organize cannabis related criminal records expungement and cannabis job training programs. ASA also worked with Congressman Lou Carrera's office to secure language from the VA Medical Cannabis Research Act into the bill, uh, which would direct the Department of Veterans Affairs to conduct clinical trials on the effectiveness of cannabis in treating conditions ranging from chronic pain to PTSD. In a surprise move, the Senate voted on Tuesday of this week to approve the Cannabidiol Research and Expansion Act well, while passage of these bills is encouraging and demonstrates the momentum of cannabis as a policy issue, the Senate has no plans to consider uh, the bills I previously mentioned this session. And with the session drawing to a close, uh, all of these bills will have to be reintroduced to the 117th Congress uh, when they are inaugurated in January. Um, they'll be considered dead otherwise. Um, so uh, this, this year, we all know, was a record year for voter turnout. Um, we had cannabis on the ballot across five states. Um, support for cannabis tracked uh, with public polling done by Pew and Gallup. Um, they had done for support of cannabis. Um, we saw about two thirds of voters backing adult use initiatives, while the margins on the initiatives involving medical cannabis were closer to 70%. Um, so this is this is now uh, what our country looks like as far as legalization goes. The blue um, are all states with medical cannabis legalized. Our two states in orange there are the two new states where medical cannabis has been legalized. That's South Dakota and Mississippi. And the or and the yellow uh, states are the cannabidiol only or low THC programs. Uh, there are 4.4 million patients now across the country uh, with 35 states uh, and DC and all the overseas territories having medical cannabis programs. Um, so on the topic of these uh, state ballot, ballot initiatives, four uh, adult use initiatives passed in Arizona with about 60% of voters uh, in Montana with, a, with just under 60 at 57 there. New Jersey voters approved adult use question one with 67.1% of the vote. Um, South Dakota residents also approved the adult use amendment A with 53.4% of the vote. Again, uh, we saw two uh, medical cannabis initiatives and support for them was generally much higher um, in South Dakota there. They voted on both and 16% higher support for medical cannabis versus the adult use. So even in a deep red state like South Dakota and Mississippi, we're seeing um, pretty strong support with 74% there in Mississippi. Um, so we also saw a congressional election. Um, Democrats lost 10 seats while Republicans gained 14 by filling some vacancies alongside flipping seats. Uh, the Democrats main, maintained the majority of the House and voted to keep Nancy Pelosi as the Speaker. Uh, Democratic leadership remains widely unopposed to cannabis reform. Many were co-sponsors on the Safe Banking Act or the MORE Act or the Veterans Cannabis, or excuse me, the Medical Cannabis Research Bill we also saw passed. Um, unfortunately, we still don't know about the Senate. Um, control will ultimately be decided by the runoff election in Georgia. As it stands, Republicans maintain 50 seats with the Democrats at 48, and McConnell remains the Senate Majority Leader, um, while Schumer remains the Minority Leader. But those those positions would flip 
um, if the Democrats were to win both Senate races. <clears throat> uh, so as far as the leadership goes in the House, um, or excuse me, this is the Senate. Uh, we still have Mitch McConnell on top, as mentioned, uh, John Thrun um, as a majority whip or minority whip if, if that changes. Um, John Barrasso uh, as the conference chair, policy committee chair, Roy Blunt, uh, Joni Erst uh, saying the conference vice chair. Um, <clears throat> the, the assistant Democratic leader will be Patty Murray. Um, well, the Senate Democratic chairwoman, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, will be Debbie Stabenow. Um, vice chair of the conference, Elizabeth Warren, uh, also vice chair, Mark Warner, uh, the steering committee, Amy Klobuchar, chair of outreach, Bernie Sanders, uh, Joe Manchin uh, will be communications committee and secretary of the conference, Tammy Baldwin, DNC chair, Chris Van Hollen. So really aside from uh, Joe Manchin on the Democrat side, a pretty uniformly pro-cannabis um, lineup there. Um, and then looking forward to the House, I'm going to go through these a little more quickly. Um, Pelosi remains speaker with Steny Hoyer, um, the majority leader. We have Clyburn as the whip. Um, all of them are unopposed to cannabis as well as largely the Democratic leadership um, as well. We all saw them vote in favor of the Moore Act. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> so incoming President Biden's campaign uh, released their approach to federal cannabis policy in July of this year, uh, recommending cannabis decriminalization, expungement uh, of past cannabis criminal convictions, and rescheduling cannabis to a lower schedule than Schedule 1 of the Controlled Substances Act, uh, and continuing to let states set their own policies on adult use cannabis. Uh, so Kamala Harris, um, the incoming vice president, was a, the sponsor of the Moore Act in, in the Senate, um, and she's been generally pro-cannabis uh, throughout her Senate career. <clears throat> um, so we can also expect some key appointments uh, in, in the coming weeks uh, among the Biden-Harris administration. Um, you know, really what, what we're, we're looking at is uh, Attorney General, they're looking like they're gonna look, uh, point to Doug Jones. Uh, we're waiting on HHS, Treasury, and Secretary of Commerce picks. Those will all be probably what are most important to cannabis patients. Um, and now I'm gonna turn things over to uh, Steph. Uh, you there, Steph? I am, can you hear me? I can, here you go. Great, um, hello everyone. Um, happy almost end of 2020. Um, and thanks, thanks Andrew for the presentation and Debbie. Um, you guys have been doing amazing work in this crazy time. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about what a Biden-Harris administration uh, means. Um, and of course, um, you know, where there's a potential that there will be a safe banking act that's, that's put into the COVID relief uh, for 2021, uh, we're still waiting to see that. There may be um, some items added to the, um, to the budget um, that we'll be uh, looking for as well. Um, I think you know, it's, it's definitely very remarkable that um, in this election cycle that um, you know, the national support for cannabis was so strong that Biden, who has traditionally been very anti-cannabis, um, felt that he needed to come out favorably for cannabis uh, to be able to win this election. And so, you know, looking at back to what uh, promises uh, Biden and Harris made during, uh, the, uh, during their campaign, there's some things that they can do and there's things that they cannot do. Uh, so for instance, the, um, they can't by themselves reschedule cannabis, they can call on HHS to make better recommendations. They can call on DEA 
um, to make recommendations or potentially create a new schedule um, that Canvas could fit in, uh, but they can't just sign something and say Canvas is now uh, no longer schedule one. Uh, but there are some pretty exciting things that, that they can do. Um, and this is where I'm sure um, we're gonna be calling on, on all of our members to reach out to the administration. Uh, but some of those include, um, you know, the, the, the POTUS, you know, the Office of POTUS can, um, which is the president of the United States, uh, POTUS can um, uh, make a, a judgment that HUD can't kick people out simply for medical cannabis use. Um, and as you guys know, we have lots of patients that are in Section 8 housing and many people who um, you know, could be patients but, but, but can't risk losing their home. Um, and so have had to make that choice between their home and their health. Uh, you know, through uh, OPM, uh, they can actually, uh, Biden can uh, get rid of drug testing for cannabis. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people in DC, we all know OPM because we check to see if the offices are gonna be open for um, snow days, uh, but the office um, also sets all the personnel um, standards. So Biden uh, absolutely can tell the OPM director to stop testing for cannabis. Um, and this of course, would affect uh, millions of Americans who, um, you know, again have to choose between their employment and um, uh, and their their health. And obviously, I think that if the federal government makes that move, uh, it'll signal uh, to the private sector, which 65% uh, of the private sector still drug tests for cannabis. Uh, again, leaving millions of Americans who could benefit from from medical cannabis um, out of that. Um, the Biden administration can also um, uh, push the Veterans Administration to allow doctors to recommend cannabis. Um, and you know, I think really we're looking at what are some of the you know, um, policies that are more sort of uh, less substantial. But of course, um, we're expecting that um, Biden will also um, you know, signal for the, uh, you know, a, a new issuance of, of a coal memo. Um, that's something definitely the Department of Justice, he can do through his oversight of the Department of Justice. Um, they can say that cannabis could be the lowest priority uh, for arrest for Department of Justice, signaling to US attorneys, um, you know, to not bring those, um, those cases forward. Um, but he cannot by himself decriminalize cannabis. That would have to be an act of Congress. Uh, but again, he can set priorities for the administration. Um, the same is true, uh, you know, of, of, of other administrative agencies. And um, as far as uh, being able to expunge records, I believe you'd have to create a new law. And we're still looking at that. Um, we're hopeful that that's something that um, that the office of the president can do, but 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 we're not certain. Um, but I also want to, you know. Uh, remind everyone how excited we were when Obama uh, was elected. And in the first days of that administration, we were all so excited to hear Eric Holder uh, say that he was going to uphold uh, Obama's election promises to stop the raids. And following that, we, we saw the Ogden memo and the Cole memo. Um, but for those of you who lived through that time, we know that there were actually more raids under the, under the Obama administration uh, than the uh, Bush and Clinton combined. And because Congress really felt like um, Obama through his actions, the Department of Justice had really dealt with all of the issues of cannabis. Uh, it took us three and a half years to get Congress to introduce legislation. Again, even, you know, even the legislation um, like the, you know, the amendment to the Department of Justice that would stop uh, the DEA from raiding. Uh, and you know we had had we had introduced that bill every year uh, for almost a decade before Obama, um, and you know again Congress just felt like there was nothing for them to do. And obviously, um, you know this next session, uh, Congress is going to have a lot on their plates, right? They're going to have to be dealing with COVID. We're going to be dealing with the economy, and so I just want to remind people of that time. Um, and know that we can't let off our pressure. You know, we've got to keep pressuring Congress. We've got to keep, um, you know, keep this issue in front of the administration um, because you know there, there's there's going they're going to be working on a lot. 
Um, and then the other thing I just want to remind people of, and, and this is especially towards um, the medical cannabis industry, is that at the end of the Obama administration, we were starting to see quite a few um, fines for the industry from um, OSHA and FDA and EPA and USDA. Um, and under the um, Trump administration, uh, you know, he actually didn't uh, fill a lot of the jobs in those administrative um, agencies. So you know, we didn't see a lot of activity um, you know, from those agencies, but I'm expecting under a, um, a Democrat uh, uh, administration that we're going to see robust federal agencies um, and so this is just a reminder to the cannabis industry uh, to make sure that they're following all employment laws, that they're um, that the health and safety of their employees are um, you know are well documented, um, you know that they're not putting mislabeling their products, that they're not using pesticides, you know all of these items that maybe they slipped uh, when they weren't being watched under under the Trump administration. And so that, so I, I feel like the outlook for Biden Harris is, you know, there's there there are a lot of things that Biden can do. Um, we're going to have to keep the pressure on to make sure that those happen, and uh, we're going to have to keep the pressure up with Congress uh, to remind them that there are still millions of Americans that do not have access to medical cannabis. <laughs> So um, huge news uh, in case you, you didn't hear. Um, <laughs> we rescheduled cannabis um, at the UN level. Um, and for people who have been members of, of Americans for Safe Access for a while, uh, you'll know that uh, rescheduling medical cannabis was actually a part of our strategic plan that we created in 2002. Um, the reason that it was on our strategic plan was that uh, back in 2000, well, starting in 1996 through 2002, before ESA started, um, the Attorney General of the United States, Barry McCaffrey, and um, later Asa Hutchinson, um, and sorry, Ashcroft, and then uh, DEA, as, um, Asa Hutchinson, they would all cite the UN single treaty um, and the US's role in that treaty as the reason we could not move forward with medical cannabis. And so um, we put rescheduling cannabis at the UN level at, in, in, into our work plan. And you know, to be honest, I am a little surprised that we uh, changed that policy before uh, we did in the United States. Um, but uh, in a way it's pretty fitting since it was the United States that um, that actually pushed uh, cannabis prohibition globally. It was uh, Anslinger who uh, made cannabis illegal in the United States for very racist reasons. Uh, and he pushed that racism uh, to the UN and across the globe. So um, if, if you guys don't remember, um, you know, the, the scheduling um, of cannabis at the UN level was based on a report um, that was put out before the World Health Organization even existed back in 1934. And that was the last scientific document that the UN had looked at to schedule cannabis. And so uh, we began uh, pressuring the World Health Organization uh, to do a, a new critical review of cannabis. Um, and uh, we were able to get the International Narcotics Control Board um, to pass a um, uh, to pass a resolution calling on the World Health Organization to do a new critical review, we were able to get the Committee on Narcotic Drugs um, at the UN level uh, to request the WHO um, uh, do a critical review, and still they weren't doing it. And then, um, if you guys remember, a few years ago at um, the ASA conference, uh, we all actually participated in reviewing a updated version of the critical review, which we handed into the WHO and to the Committee on Narcotic Drugs. And a few years later, the WHO finally um, issued a new review. And in that review, it was actually a little better actually even than our own recommendations um, and said that, that cannabis absolutely had medical value and that the scheduling should reflect that. Um, and what is exciting about the scheduling, um, the change in scheduling 
uh, at the UN level is that the uh, 1960 um, and 71 um, uh, drug policies that we signed on to, um, actually most people think of them as drug control, but these, um, these treaties were, are about access and control. And so by the Committee on Narcotic Drugs uh, recognizing the medical use of cannabis means that all of the countries that have signed on to the UN uh, single treaties, um, they actually have a mandate now to create access to medical cannabis. And so this is a, an exciting uh, change and an exciting um, you know, opportunity for medical cannabis advocates all over the world to now uh, be able to go to their governments and have conversations about medical cannabis. So in the same way that uh, the DEA and the um, attorney general's offices here in the United States um, you know, told advocates and, um, and the states that the reason we couldn't change federal law was because of medical cannabis um, is, uh, you know, the same, um, is the same reason, the same um, uh, issues that, that, that people have dealt with in, in other countries um, um, uh, at, at, you know, across the world. And so what this means for people who live in countries where they have to follow um, UN single treaties. Obviously, the United States, we, we sort of pick and choose um, which, which treaties we are part of. Uh, for instance, we still have a death penalty. Um, uh, we're one of only eight countries. And so, um, but, the, but many countries, uh, they, they can't really step outside of these, these policies uh, for various reasons. And so for patients who are in you know, these, these other countries, they now have an opportunity to go to their federal governments and, and talk about medical cannabis. So this is um, really, you know, 2020 was a very hard year for, for, the, for the globe, um, but this is definitely a, a shining light and, and something that is going to affect patients um, all over the world. So thank you all, all of our members who have been working on this with us um, over nearly two decades and um, you know, congratulations and congratulations to, um, to our members of IMCPC, the International Medical Cannabis Patients Coalition, which include uh, patient organizations like Americans for Safe Access um, in almost 60 countries uh, that have been you know, working with their governments to make sure that this, this very important vote happened. And then the the last thing I want to talk about um, are our um, priorities for 2021. Because, so as, as Andrew mentioned, you know there are um, you know we've been able to pass a lot of different pieces of legislation, you know, through one house or the other. And you know, um, at Americans for Safe Access, we were very proud um, to have you know to have passed the um, uh, the Hinchy Rohrbacher Amendment, or sorry, it, it was later called many, many other amendments, but the amendment to the Department of Justice to stop the raids. Um, and that was something that we'd worked on for years. And of course, um, Senator Mikulski from Maryland uh, finally brought that across for us. Um, but you know, since, you know, that wasn't really legislation creating a pathway for medical cannabis. That was really um, you know, just a policy to, to, to take uh, patients and their providers sort of out of out of the, the conflict, out of a war. Um, but it means that we've just been sort of sitting here uh, without a comprehensive program. And so we're, while we are very grateful to um, our champions in Senate and Congress that have been you know, sort of biting off pieces of, of this issue, um, we think that it's time now that, we have a, now that we have a majority of the states that have medical cannabis laws uh, to uh, introduce uh, legislation that would uh, ultimately make medical cannabis available for everyone. And so we see that happening in, in, um, in, in introducing comprehensive legislation that would basically do two things. One, it would create a new schedule for cannabis. So we don't think that descheduling will happen, um, but we don't think that cannabis belongs in schedule two either. And so we're actually su suggesting a new schedule that maybe some of the other um, plant medicines could go into. 
And the second thing would be um, an office of medical cannabis control. And, you know, through IMCPC, Americans for Safe Access, we've been working with countries around the world to pass federal legislation. There are now uh, more than 40 countries that have uh, federal medical cannabis programs. And all of those programs have a office of medical cannabis uh, that can oversee the uh, distribution, um, cultivation and manufacturing of cannabis. And the reason this is, is important is that I think we, we've all seen through the hemp uh, bill, the Farming, the farming Act um, uh, bill, uh, the hemp provision um, that called on FDA to oversee CBD is that, is that it doesn't quite fit, cannabis doesn't quite fit into the parameters of FDA and of what we have traditionally thought of drug development. And so by creating an office of medical cannabis, we're recognizing the special uh, properties of medical cannabis, uh, but still making sure that all of the other federal agencies uh, that look out for the health and safety of, uh, of Americans can participate in that process. And so uh, what we're suggesting isn't that we just throw out all of the amazing work that we've done at the state level. Uh, we're actually talking about really building on that work and still, of course, including um, the states in a huge way to make sure that they're part of the, the licensing of the cultivation and the manufacturing, um, but that it shouldn't matter uh, where you are in the United States, um, so you should be able to use their, your medicine. And so just to remind people, if we had a federal comprehensive uh, program, this would mean that you could travel anywhere. You wouldn't have to worry about um, visiting your family, um, obviously after COVID, <laughs> um, but you wouldn't have to worry about whether or not you could get your medicine. Um, you know, if, you have, if you're in one state and you're using a medicine that works, um, you don't have to worry about moving to another state and not being able to find that medication. Uh, it means that we'll probably see lower prices um, for, for cannabis because there can be interstate commerce. So um, manufacturers from one area can, can sell that product in another. But what we see is, again, not sort of starting from scratch, but really seeing you know, the, the, the current licenses um, that states have given for cultivation and manufacturing of medical cannabis. Uh, they've gone through an amazing process, right? They've done amazing security um, protocols and background checks. Um, the people who have these licenses have really done an amazing job to get them. And so instead of um, you know, having them start over, we would see um, the cultivators and manufacturers actually grandfathered into the DEA um, cannabis and uh, cannabis manufacturing and cultivation licenses that exist you know, that we, you know, that right now there's only one of them uh, given out uh, to the University of Mississippi, uh, but basically anyone in the United States that had a medical cannabis uh, license to cultivate and manufacturing would automatically have that DEA license. And again, that would allow them to be able to utilize their products in research. They would be able to move those products um, uh, from state to state. And then, you know, uh, if you look at dispensaries, so again, instead of, um, forcing uh, a new license, any, any person that had a dispensary license, they would automatically get what is called a specialty pharmacy license, which is a, a federally recognized license. And we've gone through every agency and looked at how they would participate uh, and how we could move, you know, move forward with federal legislation in a way that won't interrupt the current access we have, uh, but we'll make sure that those patients in Indiana and Iowa and places where we haven't been able to, to, to pass legislation that they too can have, can have access to medical cannabis. And then of course, if we pass comprehensive legislation, then things like banking issues and taxation issues, those would be taken care of because medical cannabis would be a federally recognized uh, product. It, the businesses that serve medical cannabis patients uh, would be legal. And so instead of trying to do sort of one off or, or, or really just sort of policy uh, procedures like the Cole memo uh, at the DEA and DOJ, uh, cannabis would be legal and would be um, you know, traded both internationally and um, at the interstate level, just like, like any other commodity. 
And so we're gonna need your help uh, next year uh, to pass this. We think that um, it's time. And um, you know, again, we've, we've done a lot of work to make sure that uh, the work that we've been doing at the state and local level um, you know, won't disappear, that it'll be incorporated and really be a part of the, the knowledge base that we bring to federal policy. Um, but, it's, but it's also time to, to stop looking at just sort of one-off um, pieces. And at this point um, with uh, 35 states uh, with medical cannabis laws uh, and um, DC and the, and the other territories, uh, you know, we think it's time uh, to really look at a, at a comprehensive approach that recognizes uh, the medical use of cannabis and will finally move us into a stage where uh, patients and doctors can use cannabis as a frontline treatment and patients don't have to choose between employment and their health. They don't have to choose between their housing and their health. Uh, and um, yeah, I know that we can that we can do this, but again, there's a lot going on in the next session. So everyone is going to really need to come out and you know, be a part of the action alerts, call your members of Congress, uh, whatever emails you get from ASA staff, they're gonna send you in the right direction. And so I think that's, um, that, those are my presentations, unless I left something out, Debbie. No, that was okay. good. <laughs> um, now we are going to um, uh, go move into the Q and A portion. So if we kind of rush by anything, if you want us to go back to any of the slides, um, please let us know. But before we do that, I just want to say, um, you know, patient engagement is critical. Um, and as one of our slides mentioned, the patient uh, a, a number has increased by almost a million and a half in a year. A million and a half. In, in one year, which is amazing. Um, and our work with grassroots networks and coalition partners will continue um, at the state level in 2021, first to maintain COVID reforms and prioritize patient policy concerns and to work with our ASA state chapters and partners to support their ongoing uh, legislative and regulatory advocacy priorities. Um, as, as the patient counts continue um, to rise, the urgency for states to make reforms is only increasing and we cannot do this work without you. So we really encourage you, um, if you're not already an ASA member, to sign up for ASA membership. Um, it is only $35 a year and we have special discounts for students and veterans. Um, and also we will be hosting a members only uh, meeting or webinar in early January, 2021. So if you wanna be a part of that, please um, sign up as soon as possible. Um, and we really do thank you. We, we honestly cannot do this work without the support of our members. Um, so thank you so much for that. Tell folks about the, um, about the um, membership program for um, those amazing employees um, at dispensaries that are um, making sure that our patients have access? Yeah, we had that slide somewhere. I'm not sure what happened to it, but um, you know, after COVID, one of, the, one of the things that we did is to thank everyone, maybe we did talk about this, but to thank everyone um, for working during that time, risking their own lives, we did offer free membership to essential workers and free business membership to those um, businesses that remained open during COVID. Um, so that is uh, still available for any essential businesses and, and employees out there to sign up for free. And that is a thank you from us to you. Yeah, so any of our members, they can you can let your, um, your local dispensary know um, that um, as a thank you for staying open, that there's a, uh, free uh, membership for the business and, and of course all of their employees. Yes, for, for everyone that works there. Um, so we're gonna move into the Q&A portion and um, we also have Dustin McDonald. Uh, he had a little uh, issues earlier, but he is on, uh, he is our interim policy director. We have Steph, myself, Andrew. Um, we've already have a few questions um, and please continue to ask away. Jeffrey, do you want to um, lead us with our first question? I would love to. <laughs> um, so 
one thing that came up very timely is yesterday we had the uh, Senate pass S2032. Um, so can you fill us in on what's going on with that? What are next steps on that? Just catch us up. For sure, Dustin, I'm happy to jump in and, and answer that one and anyone else feel free to jump in also. Last night's vote was a little bit of a surprise for kind of everybody in the advocacy space in DC. Of course, last week, we saw the House pass by voice vote for a Blumenauer's HR 3797, which is a similar how, a similar version to the Senate bill that was approved last night, 2032. Um, ACE is reaching out and is making contact with the, uh, with the sponsors of those offices who worked on the bill and introduced the bill, and that's Senator Feinstein, um, Shatson, Grassley, and uh, they're actually holding a call on Friday to talk through next steps on the legislation. Uh, so obviously, from our perspective, we would love to see the bill reconciled with Blumenauer's HR 3797, um, and the bill get to the president's desk in some way before the end of session, ideally through the COVID relief package. And on that front, we're just reading the tea leaves here. This is all speculation, um, but Congress is likely to need to pass another continuing resolution, giving themselves a little bit more time to finish work before the end of the year. So there is some wiggle room here to play with, um, and we'll learn a little bit more Friday about exactly what the plan is going to be. All right. Um, anyone have anything to add to that? <laughs> I feel like that was well covered. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I guess Dustin will probably be putting out a blog about that for people to follow up, correct? <laughs> definitely, yeah. As soon as, as soon as we get more scoop on Friday, we'll definitely be back in touch with folks and let them know what's coming down the road, what they can expect towards the end of this session, and any opportunities for engagement. All right. Um, we also had a question about what effect, if the Biden administration uh, or the legislator uh, made a move for towards rescheduling or descheduling, what kind of impact would the, that have on existing cannabis programs? There's a lot to be figured out on that front. I think when you take a look at federal approaches to descheduling so far legislatively, we saw the MORE Act, of course, move through the House this year and receive a vote very recently this month and was passed across uh, passed through the house that legislation is the only legislation that's moved through that entertains the notion of descheduling but descheduling by itself simply removes federal prohibitions related to cannabis possession use and sale and associated research but doesn't really force regulators to do anything with respect to cannabis to advance research um, to organize and implement policies through the administration that deal with a lot of the, the very much intricate and necessary work that Steph described through the Office of Medical Cannabis Control. So while descheduling would essentially uh, remove all federal prohibitions on all the things that we wanted to with respect to cannabis, it doesn't actually require federal agencies or departments to do anything. And that is what we believe is the true value of OMCC and that legislative proposal is that it establishes an office that would essentially function as a clearinghouse for medical cannabis and help guide other federal departments and agencies who might have competing agendas related to cannabis policy reforms at the federal level and really kind of ensure that the medical com component of it in particular stays on a track so that research can be advanced and patients can be served, insurance can be extended, everything that patients really need and have been asking for for a long time on the federal level. And I would, I would just add to that, Dustin, that if, if, if cannabis is um, descheduled, if it's taken off the scheduling, um, uh, you're correct that yes, that you know, as far as the, the DOJ is concerned, it would be out of that arena. But in, in order for it to move into uh, that substance, cannabis to move into research, it would have to be put in a schedule. Um, it's just the way medicines work. And so um, it's the way dietary supplements work. It's the way all of these work that it would actually end up coming back into a schedule. And that's why we think it's so important that we're a part of deciding that um, and, and creating that comprehensive legislation. All right. Um, we had another question that I thought was interesting. Um, we have uh, a 
uh, advocate expat who's in uh, Germany now and uh, wondering how they can be involved in uh, advocating in their new country. Um, so we can talk about Germany, but more, more generally also just in other <laughs> countries. I can take this one. Um, so we, we mentioned earlier that ACE has got tons of free resources up on our website. Um, and I'd say that's, that's where you should start. Read, read your laws, try to use your country's cannabis program and find the weaknesses, find where patients are losing out on access, um, have trouble getting it. Um, and highlight those. Um, produce resources like ASA does. You can, you know, you can go on our website and check out check out ours. Copy them for Germany. Um, we we do have an advocates training center on our website, which has yeah. a ton of free resources because one of the main priorities is ASA is to teach other people how to advocate. So I think that's a great question. Um, I know some of them might because of. Uh, German laws might be different, but definitely use those resources that we have, and um, hopefully they'll they'll be helpful to you. I would just also say, you know, um, the law in Germany is pretty exciting. Um, there's actually insurance coverage, so um, educating patients and doctors, um, you know, that cannabis is uh, available, that it is a treatment um, that that they can utilize. It's you know, it's. It's a pretty exciting place to be a patient advocate, actually, because <laughs> um, you get to fo focus on um, on the benefits and the use um, rather than than uh, just trying to explain that that it's even a possibility. <laughs> All right. Um, something we touched on at the beginning was uh, the sort of state responses to COVID. Um, that we organized uh, around our, our recommendations to governors. Um, those, uh, some of those accommodations for COVID have been very beneficial for patients. Uh, and so I was hoping you could touch on um, what we can do to make sure that those stick around. For sure, yeah, I think that's something that ASA will definitely be talking about in our members only webinar that Debbie mentioned that we're going to run in early January as we talk about our legislative and regulatory priorities for the coming year will include state level priorities as well. And the biggest one to your point, Jeff, and whoever brought that question to us is just that we saw states imp make improvements and reforms to medical cannabis programs that patients have been clamoring for for years. And I thought it was interesting to take a look at this year where you had five statewide ballot initiatives approved authorizing everything from adult use to medical access, you know, these are ballot initiatives that really are kind of constraining, you know, once a ballot initiative goes through, it's certainly very exciting for new rights and, and responsibilities associated with cannabis possession use and sale for patients and consumers alike. However, um, those initiatives are often very difficult to change in the legislature, they usually qu require a two thirds majority to change. Here we see in, 20, in 2020 under COVID, regulators step in to impose many of the reforms that people typically drive through ballot initiatives. Um, and so ACE will ab absolutely be working with our state chapter leads, with our coalition partners in states, with state regulators and with state lawmakers to try to hold on to those, those improvements. Again, we saw everything from improved access via curbside pickup and delivery being authorized, delivery being a critical component strongly for patients in COVID and, uh, and before and after COVID. Um, everything that was done to try to reduce cost to patients and improve the affordability of being a cannabis patient while we still lack insurance. Um, things like uh, states allowing uh, ongoing enrollment in state programs, not requiring patients to renew their enrollment annually as they are now to try to help save patients some money and allowing patients to interface with their doctors for a recommendation utilizing telehealth instead of having to go to, a, to an office visit. So a lot of great features in there and absolutely ASA will be working with our state chapters, with our grassroots volunteers, with our coalition partners to drive to maintain those in 2021 and beyond. 
And, and I want to say a lot of those issues were issues we were already advocating on the telehealth, the delivery. I think everything um, but curbside. Yeah, everything but curbside. <laughs> right now, though, the temporary regulations were things that were needed, anyways. And those were things that we were advocating on. We were always advocating to make your state programs better. And those are some examples of some of the things that we were, we were and will continue to advocate on to make sure that they remain. Because I know a lot of patients have come to us worried about um, will they take these these uh, these options away after COVID and we will work hard to make sure that doesn't happen because we know patients need them. Great. And Debbie before we end I, I, I just got to see the attendees list which I didn't see before and there's so many people on this call that I just adore and have been ASA members for so long so um, I just wanted to, to take a second and say it's so good to, well I'm not really seeing you but it's good to see your names um, and thank you all for, for the work you've been doing over the years. Uh, and um, I'm, you know, I'm very honored that um, Americans for Safe Access has been able to keep focused and accomplish um, the many of the goals that, that we've set forward. And of course, we still have a lot of work to do, uh, but just seeing your names reminds me, you know, how far we've come and, you know, that we're we're now turned a corner where we're not just that we're not fighting with police um, all the time. Um, and instead we're, we're dictating policy and, and looking at, at how to move forward. And, um, you know, and we're doing that with police. Uh, so it's a very different time. Uh, very, you know, even, even um, uh, a politician like President Biden, who was so anti-cannabis, you know, that he has to come out and, and be in favor of it. It's truly a testament to the work that all of you um, have done. So if I don't uh, uh, see you um, or hear from you before, have a great holiday season. And, um, you know, I think 2021 is probably gonna be pretty weird <laughs> too. Um, but as we can see um, uh, from, from what we were able to accomplish in 2020, um, ASA members won't let a little thing like that um, hold us back. And then I also just wanna say, ASA staff, you guys have been amazing. Um, I'm so grateful and, you know, always just honored to, to work with you all. And, and, you know, I definitely sleep better at night knowing that uh, you all are, are looking out for all of us patients. So thank you so much. Thank you. That was, that was really nice. And um, yeah, if we, if we, if you guys have any questions that we haven't answered already, I know there's probably a few more. I don't know if you want to stay on for a minute or two, but if, but you can reach out to Dustin and Andrew anytime. It's Dustin at safeaccessnow.org, Andrew at safeaccessnow.org. Um, we are happy to work with you and, and help you um, um, with your needs. And we want to hear about your needs. And I also do want to give a quick shout out to our annual sponsors um, and supporters. Every year we have, um, we don't have a lot of companies that support us, but we do have some great, some great companies that support us every year. Um, Dr. Bronner's, Southern California Co um, Coalition, CannaSafe, Tacoma Wellness, BASA, 3C Cannabis, uh, Comprehensive Cannabis Consulting, BPG, A2LA, CV Sciences, Newly, New Leaf Botanics, Farm Strong, uh, Joy Organics, Humboldt's Finest, New Cannabis Adventure, and True Pharma. Thank you so much um, for supporting us this last year um, when really we needed it the most. And we really appreciate you all. Um, we appreciate all of our members and supporters. And we hope that you will stick with us in 2021 because Cannabis um, um, is not inevitable. Legalization is not inevitable. It's only going to happen through organizations like ASA that we continue advocating and changing minds and educating patients and educating medical professionals, and educating politicians. And we cannot do that work without you all. So thank you so much for joining us today and supporting us. And we look forward to um, talking with you more in 2021. Thanks, Thanks everyone. <laughs> Thanks everyone. <laughs> Bye.